is an historic event. Welcome to the first town hall on the intersection of AIDS and disability at the, um, at the International AIDS Conference. It's the first town hall anyone's ever attempted here. It's also the first uh, interactive session on this topic. So this session is brought to you by AIDS Free World and Disabled People International. And I want to start by acknowledging the um, people who gave us the money necessary to make it happen, which is not something I love doing except when the groups are great, which they are. So first of all, we are deeply indebted. Actually, we're not indebted, but we're grateful <laughs> to Comic Relief and to Irish Aid. And we got crucial additional support from the Global Fund for Women and from NUPG. 50 pesos for anyone who knows what NUPG is. It's the National Union of Public General Employees in Canada. 130,000 trade unionists who helped us uh, bring some of our panelists here. Um, so this session starts from a, from a simple first principle. There have been 16 international AIDS conferences before this one. And until this week, there has Disability has never been recognized at an international AIDS conference as a dimension of the pandemic. Um, this is a situation that can't sustain. And luckily, the, the dam has burst here in Mexico City this week. I think if we do it right, this can be a watershed moment, a surfacing moment, when an issue which has not just been ignored but has been actively suppressed can emerge and, be, and, and assume its rightful place in the constellation of issues that are connected by the pandemic. And what we want to do here is explore it and help it to surface and, and to push it along. This panel of people in front of you, whom I'm going to introduce momentarily, are the people in the world who are doing primary research and activism at the intersection of AIDS and disability and have been living it and have been doing it for many years. We have, a very, we have a relentlessly informal approach to this conversation. You may notice there is no one on the stage. I insist on a little smattering of applause for that. Thank you. One of the things that makes disability invisible is how much of the conversation is one way. Experts at the front dispensing their wisdom to people who get the last 15 minutes of a session to say what's on their mind. In this this cannot sustain either. So we have brought the panelists down virtually to ground level. They're hovering slightly above it, as you can see. And what my plan is, to, there will be no presentations. We're going to have a conversation among the panelists. And at a certain point, I'll drag you into the conversation. And then we'll forget that there are cameras here, especially if they're not blocking your direct view. And I apologize for that. Um, and we'll just have an exchange for the next hundred minutes or so. We have a documentary crew here, as you can see. Um, we want to share this important moment with as many people as we can. And so to the extent that lights get in your eyes and camera guys get in your way and it's all kind of a little bit annoying, uh, just think of posterity and all of the people who can be here with us virtually. And thank you for your sacrifice. I want to lead, read to you just a quick paragraph in, in introducing the session to set the stage. This is from part of our materials that we shared with the panelists in advance. The objective of the session is to examine the connections between HIV, AIDS, and disabilities, to discuss what we know already and what we still need to find out about that intersection, and to explore the reasons why such a significant percentage of the human population and a group that is so vulnerable to HIV infection has been all but left out of the global response to AIDS, and to start the conversation about where to go next. Um, right here is Matilda. Veracity, Veracity, Verastegui, who is the Deputy General um, of uh, basically of the, of, the, of the UN interface with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Um, Matilda worked on the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, a process in which Mexico played a decisive role. Beside her is Yetnebersh Negusi, who lost her eyesight to meningitis at the age of five, received her first law degree from Addis Ababa University in 2006, and is currently working with the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development as she pursues her postgraduate studies. Applause is good. In the center, 
somewhat regal on her special platform, which has been built exclusively for this occasion, is Rachel Katjaje, a longtime leader in the global disability rights movement and is the current deputy chairperson of the Disabled Peoples International, as well as the chair of the Southern African Federation of the Disabled. For several years, Rachel has focused much of her effort on connecting AIDS and disability in her home country of Malawi and throughout the region. <laughs> Beside her is our, our research geek, specialist, and scientist, Nora Gross of Yale University School of Public Health and University College London. Nora is a medical anthropologist and a professor, and she's an internationally acclaimed researcher and a global expert on issues of disability in international health and development. And Nora has single-handedly done the bulk of the research that has been done to date on this planet on the intersection of HIV, AIDS, and disability. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Beside her is Shonali Shom, who's a recent graduate of Georgetown University Law School. Don't hold that against her. There are some good people in Washington, D.C., she, she was one of them. Um, she won a fellowship to work with AIDS Free World on disability, gender, and HIV. And she's been focusing on disabled women's access to HIV, AIDS information, and services in Uganda in her work, where she's been gathering information and interviewing AIDS and disability groups for the past several months. And has done some important field work. <laughs> and on the far end is Washington Opio, who's the director of the Liverpool Disability Program in Kenya. Washington is going to speak to you tonight through Penina, who's sitting in the front row, his Kenyan Sign Language interpreter. I believe we have signing in three languages here tonight. Uh, and Washington is going to speak, among many other things, about the groundbreaking work of the Liverpool Disability Program, including their innovative new program for women with disabilities who have been subjected to or at continuing risk of sexual violence. Welcome. So, Let's, let's start with the basic, with the basic link. The, the, the overwhelming, I think, majority of the audience in, at the conference are people who are engaged with the issue of AIDS. And Rachel, I want to start with you to start framing this. Why should people in the international AIDS community pay attention to issues of disability right now? I feel that it is very important for the International AIDS Society to include disability issues in their agenda because uh, disabled people are also human beings and they have rights just like anybody else. And even in the UN Convention, it is also stipulated that uh, uh, persons with disabilities have a right to a good health. So therefore, I feel that uh, the International AIDS Society has to take a big role in ensuring, in ensuring that persons with disabilities are included. And one thing that you should know that there are 650 million persons with disabilities in the world. And I think you cannot do away with that, with that big number of people, leaving them out of the development or leaving them out of the uh, health program. So it is very important for us to be included in the HIV programs. Noor, can you give us, give us the first take, and you don't have to do it exhaustively, on how AIDS and disability are linked? closely linked. Um, if, in fact, every risk factor very familiar to people who work in AIDS are also risk factors that we see with the disability community. Poverty, stigma, exclusion, lack of access to schools, lack of um, ability to negotiate things like safer sex because of the people who are disabled simply have not the economic stature and the social and until very recently, until May uh, 13th, was it? May th when the convention was uh, ratified, they didn't have a legal stature either in most countries to, uh, to be able to claim their rights. Um, these risk factors are also what you find with, uh, in, with AIDS in terms of people at risk. So this is a particularly vulnerable group. And it's a group that we simply have left off the map. Why should the AIDS community be involved? It's a it's really an issue of enlightened self-interest. We won't solve the AIDS crisis unless we include this 10% of the world's population, as Rachel said, 650 million people who are currently living with a disability and also at equal or significantly increased risk of becoming HIV positive. Um, 
let's, let's address the, um, I think, the, one of the elephants, many elephants in the room. I think the reason that there's some urgency and there's some real passion coming from the disability community, which is breaking through at this conference, is because there's a feeling that the AIDS community globally is not paying attention. Yet, Nimbersh, I want to ask you um, what you think is the level of awareness within the international AIDS community and, and why of, of disability issues and, and why it is that way. The issue, um, the level of awareness of the HIV AIDS community about disability, I can say is very loose. And, uh, but because nothing has been uh, uh, done in that area. I mean, some initiatives have been done, like the African campaign on HIV AIDS and disability, and some national level things, but it doesn't, it did not, it hasn't been brought to the, you know, to the, to the spectrum of the international attitude. And I can see that, I can share you one instance which I, has, I have been asked that, how do blind people do sex? You know, it was a funny question, which I faced just two years ago. One student uh, uh, working her master's was posing this. And my answer to this question was, sex is the only moment at which everybody gets blind. <laughs> Ovi. Thank you. Um, you can't top that. Let's talk a little bit about the specific risks in Washington. I want to bring you into this conversation. What are the specific risks in terms of HIV AIDS that people with disabilities face and, and what causes them? And this is beyond the obvious that, that Nora started with. Okay, in practice, actually, people with disabilities are facing several risk factors which really cause them to be very vulnerable to HIV and AIDS. Generally, communication is one of the biggest problem between the people with disabilities and the entire community. For instance, if I, as a deaf person, I would wish to negotiate for safer sex with a very beautiful lady who is hearing, what happens? People work on assumptions that I meant this, but maybe they don't get the clear communication that I had. So it's the communication barrier that is there is a risk, a risk factor. And then the economic status of people with disabilities. In different research that have happened, we've seen most of the people with disabilities may not be able to like really have jobs and employment. This makes them to be very vulnerable in even being able to access services like that will give them information, hence putting them to a high risk of HIV and AIDS infection. Another risk factor, our vulnerability is just there simply because the stigma from the entire society, because most of us, we are hidden in the homes, from the family settings. For instance, those who are mentally handicapped, people have sex with us and they assume we don't have any feeling. People use us for any cultural cleansing, activities that they have, especially in the African communities. Hence, it's a risk factor making us to be vulnerable to HIV and AIDS. Matilda, as someone who's worked more on the side of disabilities, how did you find this, how did you find this interve intersection? How did you start paying attention to HIV AIDS from, uh, from, from your background in the disability movement? Well, uh, I think it's a very, very new subject. Uh, and uh, I would uh, take as, as, an, as an example the international structure that is already uh, for the AIDS community and we have many, bueno, an agency in the United Nations specialized for AIDS and we have a, a fund, uh, we have a fund as well in the United Nations. Uh, it has been a long way uh, the, the, the action that at the global level in the United Nations has been taken uh, concerning AIDS. And on the other hand, we have all uh, in the family of the human rights uh, uh, treaties, the youngest one and the only one in this century is the for disabled people. So at the end, uh, to intersect these two, it's a new issue from our point of view, and it's still a long way to go. Shonali, when we talk about AIDS, we're talking about women in the largest part. 
when we talk about disability, we're also talking about women in the largest part. What are the implications of gender for this conversation? When I started looking at issues of disability, the statistics, I shouldn't have been surprised, my background is in women's rights, but you start to look at people with disabilities. If you look at people with disabilities in low and middle income countries, 74% are women. Um, so when we're talking about people with disabilities, we are talking about women. If you look at causes of disability, um, violence against women is now named by the United Nations as one of the major causes of disability. Um, in addition, women, with dis women are become disabled by gender inequity, basically. And so whether it's conditions surrounding unsafe pregnancies or violence against women, um, women are less likely than men to get preventative care or immunizations or treatment when they're ill. So just as with AIDS, you cannot talk about disability without talking about gender inequity. I want to address something else that's come up as we have as the AIDS-free world crew has been talking to people about this issue over the last week, something that has been said a number of times is, is just that it, this is too complex an issue to, to add. You know, that you're talking about 10% of humanity, you're talking about 650 million people, you're talking about a huge range of different disabilities, visible and is invisible. They have different manifestations, they have different uh, um, ways of, of, of interacting with society. And people at this conference, as we sort of talk to them informally, some of them are just saying, it's just too much. We just can't handle a whole other level of challenge and complexity when we feel overwhelmed already. Nora, how do you respond to that sentiment? Because it's real. It's important to keep in mind that it's a large percentage of humanity, but we can predict what the needs are overall for the disability community and the common needs in terms, in the face of the AIDS epidemic, far outweigh the specific needs of individual disability categories. Uh, we need access to information, we need access to um, legal protection and uh, social supports, and certainly access to uh, uh, both testing and medical services. Exceptions are made or uh, variations are made for all populations. Uh, you take, say, the women's movement. Uh, to reach women in the face of the AIDS epidemic, we have not what, just one program, but dozens of different programs and dozens of different outreach efforts. Uh, and there's no reason that this can't be done for uh, reaching the wide variety of individuals within the disability community. But overall, it's not that complex. We can predict what the, the needs are. The deaf people will need sign language interpretation. People who have visual impairments will need braille or they'll need cassette tapes. Um, people who have uh, uh, mobility impairments will need a ramp into a clinic. And these things are not only predictable, they're extremely low cost um, and easily implemented. This is not rocket science. This is just you need to anticipate and plan for this population as part of the entire population you're dealing with. So what, have you what do you make of that sentiment, though, which is real among some people in the AIDS community who just say, too much, can't handle it, overload? I think they should be talking closely to the people from the disability rights community and organizations that work on disability issues um, and uh, create a dialogue, and I think it will demystify things quickly. Chonali? Even if it is rocket science, we're talking about 650 million people. And AIDS is complicated, and gender issues are complicated, and we address all of those in depth. And so you can't, just because something is complicated, we're talking about people's lives, you don't turn away from it. Yeah, Nivers? I think the same, and uh, uh, unless and otherwise, these people, the, the people in the AIDS community, take out the letter H, which stands for human, within the HIV, they can never exclude disabled persons, because we are human. That's the letter H which creates the link. And I want to say that the above, above that even, I mean, th that their, their, their exclusion by itself, it's a human rights issue as uh, Shanali said, but beyond that, I mean, it's a kind of also not realizing the dream. So I want to focus on the letter H. That's the letter H which makes the link. The human, the humanness makes the link. And there's something which they can, uh, I mean, which they can, no, no one can disprove. No one can disprove that Yetna Bursch is not a human. <laughs> I would certainly challenge them if they tried. We're talking about 10% of the world's population. You're not going to be able to solve the AIDS crisis unless you include this 10% in all your program and outreach efforts. So again, it's enlightened self-interest. If you're not including people with disabilities 
you're not going to solve the problems you're currently addressing. And I know Matilda wanted to get on this one. Yes. Okay. Uh, I only wanted to add that there is even a common platform that uh, would be a good start to ident uh, identify. Uh, we are talking about discrimination in both cases. We are talking about ignorance. We are, uh, are talking about the need of education. We are talking about uh, the population uh, either with AIDS or with disabled, uh, or disabled people is in the poorest countries, countries in the world. So there are some common issues that uh, we should also start addressing to see how to connect. Rachel. Yes, I think I would like to agree with you to, to say the word H stands for human beings. And disabled people are also human beings. And they have got feelings. And they have got blood which runs in their body, in their system, <laughs> just like anybody else. And what we are trying to say here is that we are not trying to, uh, uh, to invent another wheel. Because the uh, disabled people's organizations are already out there. They are well organized. It's just a matter of working with them, including them in their programs, which we want them uh, to be implemented, the programs of HIV and AIDS. So there's no need for you to say this is a, a, a another thing which we are going to do. You are not going to invent another wheel. The wheel is already there. It's just a matter of using that wheel to the betterment of all human beings.